According to a new poll, only one third of young adults are actually proud to be American. One third. I guess unless someone explains the fraction to them, they'll have no idea what that means. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today's show is sponsored by Mike Lindell and our friends at MyPillow. For more than 15 years, MyPillow has been producing the most comfortable pillows in the world. But did you know they also sell Egyptian cotton sheets, the softest cotton in the world? These are ultra soft, extremely durable sheets. They come in a range of colors and sizes. Right now, for the Dr. Duke audience, you can get one free when you buy one set. That's BOGO. Buy one, get one of these wonderful Giza sheets. Simply use the code Dr. Duke. That's D-R-D-U-K-E. Please show support for Mike. He's a great conservative and he produces a wonderful product here in America. Again, the code is Dr. Duke, D-R-D-U-K-E. All right. We start with a poll that finds that only one third of young adults are proud of America. One third. How did we get here? So this poll was conducted by Issues and Insights and Tip Insights, uh, and they found that among young adults, so ages 18 to 24, you're looking at, what is is that even the youngest millennials to the oldest, you know, Gen Zers? Um, These, this group of people, only 36%, so a third, about just over a third, said that they were very or extremely proud to be Americans. Uh, They were also the group who was most likely to say that they were only slightly or not at all proud. So it's, we have some who are saying, okay, I guess we're proud. And then the rest saying, absolutely not. We're not proud at all. And so that's 35 of them, uh, 35% of them said they're not proud to be an American. And the thing is, we know this. I mean, if you would have just asked me, okay, roughly how many, what percent I'd probably say 40%. I, I, I guess I was just a little bit higher, but it, makes perfect sense when you look at how they've been educated, how the media portrays everything, how politicians come out and uh, say things to them. What they're being so-called taught is to hate America, is to only love what is inside of them and be freely express that, but not take any pride in the things that came before them. Well, the thing that's so frustrating about it is, is that it, they, their understanding of, of American history is in a complete tunnel vision, Correct. right? They, they are not exposed to his, the, multiculturalism, right? Which is the, the, the ugly redheaded stepsister of critical race theory. Multiculturalism tells us, and the progressives tell us, you can't criticize not white cultures, right? So white man, white people don't have the right to criticize Islam. We don't have the right to criticize China. Uh, These are foreign cultures, they're not white people. So we keep our mouths shut about the horrors and the slaughters and the genocide and the slavery of the rest of the world. Our kids only learn about American badness. And then when we do talk about non-Western cultures, we artificially pump them up we, we, because we can't criticize them. So we overpraise them, right? So it, it, as I said many times on this show, it's awfully funny to make heroes out of the Native Americans. To, to, to decimate America for its colonialism and its history of slavery, when you look at many Native American cultures, particularly the, the Mesoamerican and the South American Indian tribes that had their own empires, the Aztec, the Maya, the Inca, they, who used slave labor, they, had sla- they killed slaves, they, ex- they, they were genocidal. So, you know, when our kids learn about Native Americans in the public schools, it's all about wonder. Oh, they're environmentalists. They, and, and meanwhile, it's only America. The problem is, again, if these kids were taught actual history, not the we hate America history, they would be able to see how bad the rest of the world was by comparison. And I taught an entire unit, couple units on the Inca, the Maya, the Aztec to my seventh graders and seventh graders. It was eye opening to them because they hadn't, I mean, in seventh grade, it, that's early. This, they hadn't right? heard any of it, but I mean, that's kind of early for them to hear it. But I think just in knowing that they were even exposed to that will set the course will change their mind for, for going, moving forward yep. because the next unit we actually did then was we talked about Canada and we talked about the indigenous folk up in, in Canada and then we talked about Europe. And so when you get when you give students a variety context, context. <laughs> of understanding, it makes them actually appreciate what they have right here at home. You know what's so funny about that? Is that the left insists that we, we, we can't be provincial. We must teach our kids about all other cultures, except when it comes to teaching the bad things. 
Yes. So it, it, it's, it's dishonest history, right? The only culture we talk bad about is America. Every other culture, no matter how wicked and vicious. It, we, didn't we just do a show last week where, where uh, or we mentioned about Stalin and how Stalin was uh, – uh, we, we talk, I gave you the anecdote about I had kids in my classes actually defending Stalin, right? Uh, defending him after he starved to death millions of Ukrainians, right? Well, that wasn't really his fault. You're right, this kind of stuff. But, but – Talking about American culture, you always go for the jugular. I'm curious when you had those seventh, how did they react the seventh, the seventh graders? So when I started teaching the students about the Mayan culture and then the Incans and the Aztecs and talked about, you know, the sun god and, hey, let's throw people mm-hmm. off the cliff, well, the pyramids. Rip their and, hearts and, out rip and ro- throw it roll down. Roll their dead bodies down the pyramid. They were shocked. They, they couldn't actually believe that that had happened. And to them, I mean, because it was so long ago it is more kind of like it was like a fantasy thing but they did eventually get it where they were like huh right glad i don't live back then because i wouldn't have made it and i would bet as as young as they were it 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 short-circuited something when they they i'm more than completely sure they had already heard about the evils of america all right they already have that in their back pocket well and i mean you know especially in today's culture we the way the education system is supposed to work is back in fourth grade, at least here in Wisconsin, I, I can't speak to other states, but here in Wisconsin, you know, that's when you learn about uh, Wisconsin history is fourth grade. Well, with Wisconsin history, there's a lot of Native American sure. history. So they got that information three years prior. Yeah. So they had that at least going into it to th- do a little bit like compare or contrast with it. And when I talked to some of them, you know, just throughout the class uh some of them did say wow that's that was that's really bad or like that's so harsh or you could just tell the gears were turning and they were wondering wow the question is real for you is how many teachers like you were there that actually explained that side of native culture i I would hope more than there were i i I can't you know i'm not here to like toot my own horn by any means on this that's basic like that's what should be taught like i didn't go above and beyond in that look in in that aspect i'm not the least bit bothered that we teach american slavery to our kids i'm bothered that my kids only know it happened they believe it only happened here that that is a would that it's the kind of it's colonialism you're you're literally lying that the rest of the world was victims of colonialism not colonizers because you're only focused on what America has done. And when you look at countries all over the world, in places like Africa, in places like India, South America, there's a, a, a indigenous peoples, there's a whole nasty long history of that. Uh, by ignoring it, you are systematically trying to skew the way you view your own country. Uh, and to get back to this poll, because I know mom and dad, maybe at home, or grandma and grandpa, you're like, well, what? I don't care about those youngins, where do I fall? Well, here's the percentages that we got for the rest of the age groups, and you can take a look. They broke it down by region, by the age, by gender. No shock there. Males were more patriotic or proud to be from America. White people over black and Hispanic people are more proud to be from America. Income, basically the higher income, the more likely you're proud to be from America. On the right-hand side, look at black and Hispanic, right? Blacks and Hispanics, 55 and 57 percent were proud of their country. This should scare the bejesus off of you. Off of you. This should scare the pants off you. That blacks and Hispanics, who the left keep telling us are these unremediated victims, there's, there's, there's a, a, a boot heel on their throat, they have no freedom. So l- take a look at the entire thing though. Okay, look at every percentage, just look at percentages. Do, 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 you go down, every single one of them is over 50% with the exception of, of college those 18 age to 24 kids. year olds. So and 18 24 is college age. Yep. College, you go to college to hate your country. And what critical race theory is, we're now taking that model and applying it to middle school and high school as well. So we obviously come prepared with examples to back up the statistics because data can be manipulated however you want. So we're gonna take a look at Georgetown University, those 18 to 24 year olds who also agree, yeah, I'm not proud to be American. Ophelia Jacobson of Campus Reform did her work by hitting the streets and talking mostly to the young ladies, asking them, you know what, are you proud to be an American? Well, in the clip we're gonna show you, it's all women at first. And I gotta tell you, I wanna ask you to do something. We show these, these segments a lot before we even show it. 
pay attention to their dress and their circumstances. Where are they? What are they doing? What kind of life are they living as they talk about how evil America is? Roll the footage. I think a lot of things about this country are really embarrassing. Just like, I mean, racist history, colonization, even currently, just what's going on with politics and the cops. And what is there to be proud about if you're black and being like, you know, because it's just like it's a, still a lot of stuff that goes on for black people. I think that's a complicated question for me. I think I, I, I think most of the time, no, at least over like the past four years, um, it's been tricky to you know, love to be an American. The American dream is so sought after that it's not even a thing anymore. I don't even really think it, there is an American dream really anymore. I mean, like, I would honestly rather kind of live somewhere else. It's not really um, the most welcoming to most people. Can you name a country that's more welcoming than the United States? Ooh. Um, not really. I don't really know that. I don't really have that much information. I'm not sure if I can. I don't think I can. Europe. Europe. Ah, I want to go so to those two girls so that were talking there. This in their designer shorts and their mm -hmm. their, their 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 blouses and holding a cu expensive cup of coffee in one hand and shopping bags in the other. Right on a bright sunny day when they don't have to wear hijabs, where they're in shorts and they're casual, standing there. But bright where they're not, they don't have to be at work. They're not in sweatshops. Right, they're out of class, enjoying the sun, shopping talking about how just hard it is, how, how bad it is to be an American. I mean, the lack of self-awareness is staggering. And look, one of the things that education is supposed to do is make you self-aware, right? And so it shows you what a failure American public school education is when not only are we not making people unaware, pe these are these people who are completely clueless about the world they live in. And the fact that that girl, when asked, you know, can you name another country? country. Europe. Europe. But here's the thing we didn't show. Hey, but Her you know, ge geography's racist. Ge okay. Geography's white supremacy. If you like to, I'm going to, okay, I'm not, now you're going to make me sidetrack for a moment. <laughs> I took a world geography class because I was forced to take world geography. It's like, you know, 101. Intro class, whole pit section. Uh, the woman who taught the class spent the first entire day, it's just an interim three-week class, so she spent almost three hours talking about how Africa is not a country. And I think, I'm pretty convinced that some of the kids still that, believe it. Still believe that just Africa, not South Africa, which is a country, but Africa is a country. And because she was trying to demonstrate how we don't know our geography at all, but I'm pretty sure the kid to the left and right of me still was like, what? And, and that's something else, these girls. When they were asked, can you name another? another oh, yeah. country that was more welcoming, they couldn't do it. They, one, of course one, you can. One African-American girl who was whining about how hard it is for blacks said, I don't have any information. Uh, yeah, of not, course I'm you not don't have any information. Speak on this, but I can tell you that all the racist things that happen in this country, except I can't. Right, it's hard it. to be, no, so, but never examples. How can I be proud when so much stuff happens to black well, people? And this is exactly what it is, because what we didn't show is when Ophelia then says, Europe's not a country. Her response, that woman's response was, you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Well, and that's words, always the response or, I don't have enough information. Yep, they don't uh, know. They, you, they, but you, you know, you know. They so have, have these sharp have opinions mm -hmm. about how bad it is. And they can't back them up they with anything. They can't back it up with Nothing, yeah. not a single thing. And one more thing that was asked of these students was, uh, they went on to admit that basically they'd be willing to move out of this country. Yep. Or even give up their U.S. Citizen citizenship because of how they felt about America. And the one girl said, definitely, you know, and another one's like, 100%. You know, I can still vacation here. Right. Yeah, let that sink in. Y you go to vacation spots not to see misery, but to see opulence and, and fun and freedom, right? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't live here, but I'd vacation here. And those same girls who you were referencing before um, asked about, you know, did college affect your opinion about you know what you're saying right now and they're like yes college opened my eyes to these things yep. opened my before eyes before i got to, to college i didn't know my eyes were closed but now yeah. they're open Well, it's a good thing that parents are fighting back against all this critical race theory. We've been talking about it for weeks and weeks. We have ex example after example, whether it be, you know, sometimes it's kids who are being put in front of the mic to talk about it. This instance, um, we actually have data showing 
that because all these parents are stepping up in, in what they're doing, it's leading to recalls of these school board officials. <laughs> so Axios uh, looked into the data showing just how many school board members are being recalled. And between with COVID, the teaching of critical race theory, parents um, across the nation have rallied. And in just this first half, of 2021, the first half, at least 51 local recall efforts with K-12 school board members have been initiated. 51, just in the first half. And you would say, well, okay, how does that come? Like, what does that actually mean? Well, it actually means 130 elected members of these boards. So the 51 efforts can have multiple members, like in the case of Loudoun County, Virginia, which we talk about all the time. And the yearly average from 2006 to 2020 is about 23. So we're at 51 efforts to, to normally 23, and we're at 130 compared to normally 52 members. So parents are waking up. Yeah, you know, when you think about school boards, who votes for school boards? What, what no does one. That turn like, okay. I, I think in Wisconsin, I remember the last time we had, or the second last time we had a school board election, an election that didn't have a president or a. Yeah, Senate. they're always like off year, right. mo like yeah. 8%? Maybe. But maybe 8% of the population vote. And even, I mean, even when it's referendums put for your tax dollars to build Nobody those votes. millions of dollars worth of school, and I've talked about this when I worked at the newspaper, it was a difference of, tw I think it was 21 votes for 23 million dollars or 20 or vice versa but basically every vote yep. <laughs> was worth a million dollars and especially the school board members it's in our local municipalities here it's year after year the exact same person running unopposed no one bats an eye no one thinks well i'm a parent i'm going to be a parent in the school for at least 13 years Maybe I should be on the school and board. And think about this. Nope, the the liberal boards of education that run these states, all, I don't care if you're in the reddest state in the union, your school apparatus is progressive, right? And so when your people, when the typical mom and dad runs for a uh, school board, if they run at all, they don't have any money. No one's giving them money for that. But you can bet that the public school unions, teachers unions, are pumping money. I'm talking in a, in a, a local small st a city, small village, you're a mom who wants to run. Any money you get is going to be gravy. You have nothing. No one's supporting you. There's not thousands of dollars. But if you're a, a school board backed candidate, they're going to throw $150,000 at you, which is huge money comparatively. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, when you take a look at Podunk, where I'm from, and you look at bigger cities, it's like way different as to how it like it's politicians running yeah. for those school boards and they're yeah backed by the unions in podunk places i couldn't as the editor of the newspaper even get these school board members to give me a little summary that was free to them to be put into the local newspaper just to inform the people of like what's your running. name yeah. why am i running because they're unopposed so why do they care you look at the the political side of it you look at the big cities like the Loudoun counties the these big school boards that's where it's insane. And let's also keep in mind, too, that for the average mom and dad, it's something you want to do. You want to help your committee, your, your community. But in the bigger places, these posts on school boards are a springboard to larger political office. Somebody who loses the, the state assembly in their area, they, they're trying to be a state assemblyman, but they lose. What are they going to do for the next two years before they can run again? They get on school boards. Yeah, they call it their stepping stones. To them. Exactly and especially right. in, in the other people who run for these school boards may not even be parents half the time, mm -hmm. because these are the people who just got their master's degree in political science. Or education. Trust me, I know. And they're like, well, I'm looking to get into politics, as you say, and so that's their first stepping yep. stone. So they don't even care about your kids. It's just a, a means to an end for them. They, they do not care. This is unshocking to anyone. California is the state that actually has the most recall efforts going. They have 22 of the current recall efforts. Almost half are California alone. So California <laughs> moms and dads, you can attest. But and ask yourself, given how abidingly, overwhelmingly liberal and progressive California is, how bad do they have to get that they're actually <laughs> recalled? I mean, this is, this is not like recalling somebody from uh, Sparta, Wisconsin, or from Amro, <laughs> Wisconsin. This is California, right? Well, look what it took. Look at what um, Gavin Newsom mm -hmm. had to do to actually get recalled. I mean, destroy the environment of the city, lockdowns, feces from San Francisco all over the streets, and he still, it took a lot to recall him. How bad must these school board members in California be to be recalled in the first place?
Time now for some real education. Education and anti-patriotism is the theme of this week's Instant Classic. Every show this week, we've begun the Instant Classic segment with this video. Still shocks me. Uh, a mom and her son, five-year-old maybe, four, five, six years old, rips an American flag off somebody else's property, throws it to the ground dismissively. Mom approves, and they ride off to their back to their little suburban mansions. Unbelievable. And so my point is, is this is what you get. This is what you get when you have an education system that is predicated on doing nothing more but opposing your own country, putting your own country in the worst possible light, only teaching about the worst aspects of your culture, and then lying about the rest of the world. This is what you get. And so we have a quote today that helps me make this point. The quote is from the modern contemporary uh, reformer, education reformer, Anthony Esselin, who's done a lot of great work fighting Common Core and other things. Here's what Mr. Esselin said, quote, the worst feature of the Common Core is its anti-humanistic utilitarian approach to education. It mistakes what a child is and what a human being is for. That is why it has no use for poetry and why it boils the study of literature down to the scrambling up of some marketable skill. You don't read good books to learn about what literary artists do. You learn about literary art so that you can read more good books and learn more from the artists. It is as if Thomas Gradgrind, in Dickens' famous novel about education reform hard times, it is as if Thomas Gradgrind had gotten hold of the humanities and turned them into factory robotics. This is part of our problem. We, don't t we teach so much politics, so much ideology, so much left-wing critical race theory that we're not teaching them the beautiful humanities. We're not teaching them the sublime poetry or artistic, the playwright, the novelist, where they get exposed to such broad, broad uh, human ideas. Everything has become politics. Art itself has been transposed away from art into an adjunct of politics. Is it any wonder kids like that spoiled little boy and his rotten mother think that what they did to somebody else's pro pro property is a good idea? All right, well, those are the stories for today. If you have a question for us, please feel free to drop it in the mailbag by emailing askduke at fpeusa.org. And if you enjoy our content, please consider joining our Patriot Club. Your one-time $99 tax-deductible donation allows us to keep bringing you these stories every day. Simply visit patriotclub.us to get signed up. That's patriotclub.us. And of course, as a little thank you, we will ship you our signature tumbler. And that's all she wrote for this segment. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Until next time, if you got a kid that's as bratty as that, spank him.